welcome to the Metal Voice, and here we go again. Me and Alan, we did a review of Invincible Shield, and we thought, you know what, let's bring in some uh, really smart guys to give us some more opinions and remarks about... When they get here? Where, who are they? <laughs> well, they're coming soon. <laughs> Just hang in there, guys. We couldn't uh, get them, March, so we got you right. guys. You know? March the 8th, Invincible Shield will be released on Epic Records. As I mentioned, we're going to do track-by-track track review, Round Robin, the tracks that people have not heard yet. After that, we'll talk about the bonus tracks. Do they deserve to be on the album, the proper album, or should they have remained as they are as bonus tracks? We'll talk about the first four singles after that. How do they fit with the album now that you've heard the rest of the album? And we'll close off with our remarks and a review. Got Charles Lavery all the way in Germany. Tom in Milwaukee. That's why we call Milwaukee Tom in Perrin. Just north of me in Montreal. Laval Perrin. Laval. There you go. <laughs> Alcatraz is nice. Look at that, eh? Look at yes. Alcatraz. Oh, yeah? I look, like the Warlord. Show the Warlord. Tavern's going to be happy with me today. It's yeah, Deliver Us. That. Oh, it's nice. And that's it's the band that I'm in the back. Warlord? There's a back to it. Look oh, that's that. awesome. Oh, that's, that's a really bonus cool. these days. Actually, that's yeah. a nice back. I like that. That's Double-sided. Nice. I, don't, I don't have that. i got to get one, too. Yeah, I might yeah, get I, one, too. I like it. All right, guys, let's talk about Judas Priest. Let's start off with the first track. Uh, I'll let the Giles lead it off. We're going to skip track one and two. We're going to go to track three, which is Invincible Shield, the track that no one has heard yet. The fans are anxiously awaiting for this album. Giles, what do you think of Invincible Shield? Uh, it's, it's not one of my favorite tracks. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just another one of those quick, fast, short and sweet tracks nothing nothing bad but nothing nothing that particularly stands out overly not not overly melodic just you know it's probably a little bit like panic attack but not quite as good all right does it remind you of any era of judas priest actually reminds me of something off the kk's priest album actually just kind of the the fast quick um direct to the point kind of kind of song so it's it's similar to that if you want to talk about recent priest history Mm -hmm. all right uh, Tom, what do you yeah. think about Invincible Shield? I have a star next to it. Um, okay, good. It's a faster song, 16th note, double bass. What Giles says is an up tempo, faster song. It's, you know, your stock garden variety fast song. Um, really good leads on it, though. Lead solos. I like that part. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So it's just. Did it did it remind you of any era of Priest? Okay, for Giles, it's KK Priest. Yeah, but, it's not. But, um, what would you think if you had to like- this particular song to me really didn't there's a couple others that i did take note that do remind me of an earlier era but this song more recent because mm-hmm. it's scott's drumming i pay more attention to drums so you know scott's double bass work so it's probably more recent priest than in the 80s or 70s priest yeah for sure all right so you liked it though you put a little star a little sticker yeah mm. okay parent what'd you think uh, I, I use asterisks, not stars. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, I'm I'm with Giles. This one didn't have an asterisk next to it for me, uh, but it, it wasn't bad. I think, like Giles said, it's a very typical fast. I'm actually surprised this didn't open the album, right? Because it's a it's a mm-hmm. fast paced yeah, song right. that would typically yeah. open an album. It's the title track of the album. Yeah. Invincible well, Panic Field. Attacks fast, and it has a cooler intro. So. Yeah, well, definitely a cooler intro. But I I would have done Invincible Shield then Panic Attack maybe. Uh, but regardless, so fast one, uh, actually the intro, the guitar intro reminded me a lot of the intro of the serpent and the King. I don't think they're that different. It's, it's maybe, yeah, it's they're real similar. They really, yeah. they're almost too similar in a way. And, and then Jimmy, I'll, I'll kind of jump in with your, what does it sound like? Mm. You know, I say this is this album's ram it down, the song ram it down, not necessarily the album, but for me, it's that kind of, and, and ram it down is almost an anomaly on that album because, while that album is kind of, you know, kind of turbo part two with a bit of leanings towards painkiller and the Ram It Down song is what leans more towards the heavy. I, I think this reminded me a bit of a mix of Ram It Down and some of the free will burning defenders kind of stuff. So nothing wrong with it at all. It's a good early in the record uh, uh, song, but I think there's better stuff coming, which we'll get to. You know, I, I, I think it does sound like it could have been off of uh, Defenders of the Faith, more of the Jawbreaker and Free Will Burning uh, vibe. 
Uh, but I, I really enjoyed it as well. So I already gave my opinion with Alan, but, uh, you know, I'll toss in a couple of words here and there. Devil in Disguise, Tom, what'd you think? Yeah, so not only do I use a star system, but I also use a star with an exclamation point after it. Hey, system. Huh? hey look at that. So this has a star and an exclamation point. <laughs> you gotta keep trying. Uh, really, really good opening riff on the mm -hmm. song. I like Scott's hi hat usage on this song. Psh, psh, did that kind of a, an effect? Mm -hmm. um, lyrically, this song, for me, lyrics are down the pecking order of importance to me. <laughs> lyrics matter to me if they're really good or if they're really bad. I noticed the lyrics in this song. I like the lyrics. So, this is lyrically, I liked the content of this song. All right. So, Giles, what'd you think? What song are we talking about? Devil in Disguise. Uh, it wasn't one of the ones that jumped out at me. Great, great lyrics again. Um, but it's it's the next one that jumped out at me. This one, this is a good song. I think it's a good song, but it's not a great song. Could this have fit on Redeemer of Souls? Yeah, heck yeah. I think the last three Priest albums all have similarities where they, to an extent they could be fairly yeah. interchangeable because they've all been they've all been very, very good. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Perrin, what do you think? Uh, Devil in I, I attributed my first asterisk on this one out of the ones Ooh. we're talking about today. So I, I put a star next to this one. I liked it. I feel like it swings. And again, I'm always going to try and tie it to what it sounds like. I, I felt like a little bit of a metal gods, British steel kind of like a marching in time to the music. Kind of there was a, there was a swing in this one that I really liked. And I think a lot of the songs, you can kind of tie it to something old and something new. But I, I thought it was more firepower and angel of retribution. Like by the time we get to the chorus, I think the choruses are are a lot like what we've been hearing in Priest the last little while. So a little a little old British steel, a little new maybe angel of retribution or firepower. Uh, the groove is the hook. Like sometimes the chorus is the hook. I really think that the the marching driving groove in the song is the hook of the song. So. Yeah, I, I like this one. This one got my head bobbing, and it didn't sound like I'd heard it before. Yeah, I, I think Angel of Retribution would be a good era for this one. And I think you guys maybe forgot to mention, listen to to Richie Faulkner's guitar work. The sort of like little musical passage with the groove that you're talking about, Perrin. You know, it just it just it's so it's so nice the way he's playing the guitar, and uh, it's a great little musical sort of break off. You know. Um, Gates of Hell, Giles. What do you think of Gates of Hell? Love it. This is this is the first song of the ones we haven't heard yet that I would mm -hmm. mean. There you go. There you go. You know, this is the sort of thing that Judas Priest does best. Great, awesome hook, great anthemic chorus. I love the guitar melody underneath the vocal line. Yeah. Uh good up tempo song. I like the drum groove. Which reminds me a little bit of Riot, Thundersteel type of uh, privilege of power kind of uh, black leather glittering steel kind of there it is song. Uh, but I love Gates of Hell. That's that's a definite highlight for me. A little bit yeah. of a hard as iron vibe from Ram It Down too, which is another great priest song. Okay, all right, Gates of Hell, Perrin. Like this one a lot. Got a, got, so it's two in a row that I gave. Did uh, you draw a little thumb or a little asterisk? <laughs> Thumbs and asterisks. No, but this I agree with Giles. This is really a good one. Uh, you know, for me, this was my point of entry kind of moment. Like there was this kind of a dun, 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 maybe maybe with a bit more modern production. But I, I really liked I really liked that kind of point of entry, screaming for vengeance sound. Maybe a bit of hellbent for leather. Uh, it retains its heaviness, but it's not like a breakneck speed kind of heavy mm -hmm. song. It's just more of, of a feel. And Richie's solo on this one, speaking of the word feel, there's a lot of feel in the solo. This is the, I won't say it's the first solo on the album that really made me step up and take notice, but it's less Speed Demon kind of playing and more kind of phrasing and articulating and just within the song. And I really like this one. So uh, yeah, two thumbs up for this one for me as well. All right, Tom, what'd you think? Yeah, same here. It's one of my favorite tracks on the album. I wrote down this is priest, kind of what was Giles okay, was talking this about. Is this is, but this that opening, the opening chords remind, and this is another one of the songs that was reminiscent of Days Gone By. It reminded mm -hmm. me of Bloodstone from Screaming for Vengeance. The opening chords, not the entire uh, 
measures, but just the uh, opening blood, cards. Blood, had... blood stone. Yeah, that's a good. That's yeah. a really good. See, comparison. I thought desert plains. I, I felt there was a little mm -hmm. desert plains in it, but it's that. It's yeah. definitely that kind of era. I found. Yeah, and I, I also agree with the lead. The lead solo on this was really good. That stood out to me too. I wrote that down too. Yeah, very so radio friendly. Like you could see this. You know, if this was the eighties, it could have been played on the radio. People would have really liked it, enjoyed it, and the metal heads would have still thought it was a heavy enough song too. Oh, this is this has got some guts to it. Yeah, yeah. And, and one thing I'll say, guys, like if they wanted to, out of out of like fourteen tracks, including the bonus tracks on this record, they could probably play like half of this record live, and I think it would mm -hmm. go over well. Like I think yeah. I, yeah. I think the songs wouldn't be you know, piss break songs. I think the songs would come across right. live in a well setting, you know? All right. God is my witness, Perrin. No, this is one of my low points. This is one of my low points of the album, I gotta say. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I felt like the fast intro was a bit Bark of the Moonish. That's what I, I felt like. I feel like uh, Richie <laughs> was channeling his inner Jakey Lee. That's what I, I felt Bark at the Moon. And funny, normally I would say that's a good thing, but this is one of the songs where I kind of say, yeah, I feel like I've heard this all before. It just seems like you know, it's like there's these middle of the pack painkiller songs that everyone seems to love that I mm -hmm. cringe every time the band brings them back <laughs> into the set list. And for me, it's kind of like that middle of the pack painkiller, heavy for the sake of heavy, not at all bad, but my one of my least favorites on the record, just because it, I don't know, I just don't feel it's it, it's different. I don't really feel like it goes anywhere. Uh, so not a star for me. Uh, not, I was not pleased with this one. Tom, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I think I did put a star next to it, but it's not like a standout track for me. Um, I like the lead parts because it's so-called trading off. Here's the question, though, and this might be for a little later as a recap. Who's Richie trading off with? Is well, it him? Apparently, Is it himself? Apparently, what he, what he, he Is said, it Glenn? He, Is it Andy? Well, we don't know. He, don't he pretty know. much did most of the guitar work, and he said, "I would only, think so, but only, only when Glenn can do something, right. he would do something." Right, but precisely when you listen to it, you don't know. But I love trading. I love trading dual leads. I love that, and because of the fact we don't know, we have we can take an educated guess. It's primarily Richie's work because Glenn's dexterity with his condition yeah. can't do the more technical faster complicated chords you know you can't do it but we don't know for sure um but i do love the trading leads in this in this track so that's what kind of made me like it uh, mm -hmm. more than what the track really is it's like parents said it's kind of like it's there it's okay it's not a bad track charles what'd you think bark at the moon love it it's one of my favorites on the whole record really right. good uh, I mean, we're, we're never going to know how much or not Glenn played. I would, I would probably assume that if he's, and God bless him and all that, but if he's getting up on stage and sort of struggling with living after midnight, then he he isn't going to yeah. be like tearing up on the fretboard on the record. Right. So, I mean, composition is always more important than performance. If you're, you know, and I and I do think he's the, mm -hmm. I think he's definitely what composed a fair bit of the, a fair bit of this record. You know, yeah, for sure. Did you hear a little bit of that Randy Rhodes on the the solo, Charles? A wee bit, yeah. I mean, I love it. I love. I mean, I love the song. I like the lyrics. I like the the, the chorus. I like everything about the song. It's it's one of my favorite Judas Priest songs go. ever. Yeah, I liked it too. <laughs> got bite, got speed. Uh, Leather yeah, Rebel. That's what I remember from it. Uh, Escape for from reality, Tom. What'd you think? Escape from reality. Yeah. Oh, from reality. it's not yeah. my sequence. I was looking at it. What the hell am I talking about? Um, you know why? Because I, I, I removed the songs that have been already heard oh, by yeah, the fans, right. and I'm just going through the ones that no one First day with yet. my new brain. Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. Um, did you put a star, a thumb, or did you put like a thumb? No, down? I said there? this is, to me, was just an okay track. Okay. Um, multi-track. See, I don't really like it a lot when singers do multi-tracking. I like okay. I like just one voice, and that song has it. Uh, there's a Rob singing, you know, he records a couple times. I don't like that so much. But right, that's right. just a personal thing. It, I didn't. I did not have a star next to it. It's not a bad track by any means. I can listen to it. I won't mm -hmm. skip over it. Okay. But I just thought it was an okay track. 
Giles, escape from reality. Uh, yeah, I feel pretty much the same as Tom, maybe a little more positive, but it's it to me it sounds like something from one of Halford's solo albums, which are not bad by any stretch of the imagination, but it definitely has a Halford solo kind of sound to it, something off Crucible. Uh-huh. What about that Aussie whale or that wine, we'll say? Wouldn't have a clue what I listen to. Awesome. <laughs> it sounds like Perrin, what'd you think, man? Uh, so did it have did opinion. it have an Aussie wine in the middle? D- divergence of opinion here. So this is a two star song for me. I Ooh, so this, is really? track, this is track nine on the record, and by this yeah. you know by, when you're nine tracks deep into a record, it's kind of rare <sighs> you're going to hear something that you haven't heard earlier in the record. And I think All this right. is very different than everything else on the record. And I think there's a bit of a Sabbathy vibe at the start, like it is kind of the grungy moment. And then I kudos to Giles for picking out the Halford solo, but I'll go further back than that. I think when he gets to the chorus, I think there's a fight like inflection in his voice. I think Rob is singing the way he sang on the first fight record, War of Words. Uh, yes, yeah, I like this. I like this a lot. This is two stars for me. I hear fight. I hear. Well, what is that? It. Two stars out of what? No, no I mean. I, I, I thought it was like two stars out of ten. No, I got confused. Every song either has no stars, a star because I liked it, oh, okay, or two okay. stars because I yes. really liked it. This so it's might two out be, of two. This might be my favorite song on the record of the ones oh, we haven't heard. Okay, uh, just because it, right. it's dear, and I love the heavy bottom end as well. Like we're we're nine songs in, we yeah. haven't heard this yet on the record, so it's like another change in direction. Very very mm-hmm. uh, interesting, and uh, the chorus is so fight, and I love that. Okay. Sons of Thunder, Tom. This is my favorite track on the album. You know what it reminds me of? Not necessarily the song, the, how it sounds and how it's structured. It's fast. And what I mean by running time, it's not even three minutes long. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of Running Wild on Hellbent because Hellbent's a short song. They get right to it. It's classic priest. Mm-hmm. Um, the vocal, the way vocal, the way Rob sings this song is re- that stood out to me. The phrasing of his vocal work, I thought was mm-hmm. really cool and great lead. So it's just a shade under two, three minutes long. It's up tempo. It does. It delivers a good, so to speak, so to speak. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that I, it's, it's right now. It's my favorite track on the album. Yeah. That was a, one of Glenn's songs, by the way, Perrin. Ah. What'd you think? Eh, one of my least favorites. <laughs> an X is no good. So we got yeah. stars and X. Is that yeah. how it works? <laughs> too, too, too simple. Look, I, every priest, every priest record needs a three minute song about riding motorcycles. So there's that, you know, but you know, it's the 10th in the running order of the album. It's a three and a half minute song about riding motorcycles. It's, it's just really simple, catchy, but it's just a little bit too cliche and a little bit stock for me. Like, you know, and, and every album has a song like this. Like on, on the new Saxon albums, I like the ones about history and mystery. I don't like the ones that are just about riding in your car. Same thing with the KK's Priest album. I kind of complained that everything was just about the the cliche heavy metal subjects. This is kind of a cliche heavy metal subject for me. So, you know, three and a half minutes. It's not offensive in any way. It's, it's just kind of there. It's just kind of there, but it doesn't make make me think more, guys. Make me Make me analyze it a bit more. It's just too easy for me. Simple. Sons of Thunder, Giles. I, I don't want to think. I hate thinking. I, this is, I, I mean, heavy metal cliches are awesome, and they work because they're <laughs> cliche because they work, and then it, the world needs more of them. And KK's Priest are awesome at them. I love the lyrics on the KK's Priest, and I love the fact that Sons of Thunder is on this album because I like songs about driving fast and hitting the road and just being a rock and roll bad boy because that's what it's all about, hanging around in the parking lot with rock and roll women and playing heavy metal loud. This is what life is, and this is what life's about. It's about being brothers of the road and rocking. But Neil right, Pierce well went to the library, goddammit. Yeah, and that's why, I, I mean, I, I just, it's just boring. I mean, I love, I love some Rush, but I don't know what the hell they're on about most of the time. Just sing a song about rock and roll, man, and let's party and, and pick up some hot chicks with the big 80s hair. <laughs> and you know what? When I asked Richie about the song, he said this is a Sunset Strip type song. You know, it this is. Song. That's what's here. Exactly right. Right. the way to be. The way to be is to rock properly. All right. I, this would be the last of the not oh, heard the last, songs. The last thing I ever want to do is use my brain. <laughs> Perrin, Giants in the Sky. Yeah, I like this one a lot. You know, 
this is a good ending to an album. Uh, obviously, there's bonus tracks, but if you have the mm-hmm. version about the bonus tracks, this is how the album will end. And who knows? Like, you know, Richie alluded to it. Maybe it's going to be the last album of their career. So if this is the last song on Priest's last album, you know, a song that's clearly, you know, I haven't analyzed the lyrics, but it's clear it's about, you know, the great heavy metal people, maybe Lemmy, maybe Ronnie James yeah. Dio, who we've kind of lost and paying homage to those giants in the sky. Uh, so I do feel this one sounds kind of firepower-ish. I, it rem- the, the cadence of the song was a bit of like the song Children of the Sun, I thought, on, uh, on Firepower. <laughs> Mm-hmm. A little bit dirtier, grittier, and there's this thing in the middle where all of a sudden it kind of slows down, and Richie played, well, I assume Richie yeah. played this beautiful cool kind part. of classical acoustic piece, and uh, and and Rob sings very longingly and lovingly, and it's a little bit cheesy, but you know, again, I, I think metal does need a little bit of cheese. So this is a a lovely song. This is a really fitting ends to the regular part of the album, I think. And I really, really enjoyed Giants in the Sky. What about you, Giles? Giants in the Sky? Yeah, it's a good song. It doesn't quite knock me out the way it seems to have affected Perrin. It's okay. It's cool. Um, I like it. A little oh. tired of all these, all our yesterdays, look at all our dead heroes type of songs. But, you know, we've all got a couple of them of our own. So, yeah, why not? It's a good song. All right, Tom. Yep, I like the song. As a matter of fact, the opening riff I wrote down immediately without really comprehending what the lyrics are going to be about. I put down kind of like a Sabbath riff, which yeah. turned out to be the way I perceived it. My perception was they were paying homage to, you know, bands like that. So it was not kind of, of weird of that the fallen, I, of the I fallen, wrote that though. down off of the opening riff, like a Sabbath type riff, when in fact, not specifically to them, but it was kind of like, making reference of bands and individuals probably to that are giants in the sky. They're not with us anymore and they're legends, but I like it's the song. It's becoming an all too common th- thing. I mean, it yeah, is, there's just, no, just as many dead guys as there's living guys of, of who's left now almost. So yeah, it's going to be more and more of a topic really. Happen more it, often it's now. interesting. Cause all you guys, you know, the, the lyrics, even though it could have been very cheesy, cause a lot of these, our rock stars, our dead lyrics or songs are usually a cheesy song, but this one it's, it's done in such a way that it doesn't feel as cheesy as the ones that we're used to. So like, yeah, cause, that's cause Tom, goes, I'm not, cause Tom and Perrin go, I'm not really sure what the lyrics are about. That's good. Once you don't, you're not sure what yeah. the lyrics really are about. That's but a good thing. As Perrin mentioned that middle part, like Beautiful. three, two and a half, three minutes in or whatever it is, that makes it more of a better it's composition. It yeah. makes it more sentimental. But yeah. I mean, the, the acoustic or even neoclassical playing there on the acoustic part yeah. is beautiful. I mean, yeah, it's, I like that, that that's part. worth the price of admission alone. Yeah. Yep. A I well done that. song that could have been cheesy, mm-hmm. but really wasn't. That's how I look at it. Okay. Here comes the I bonus agree. tracks now. Okay. There were three Fight of Your Life, Vicious Circles, and The Lodger. So we'll talk about uh, Fight of Your Life. What'd you. I guess the question here is, what do you think of the song, and do you think it should have been on the, the album as you know a regular track, or it should have rem- it should stay, or actually it, it should stay as it is as a bonus track? Giles, I actually think this song's awesome, and it really should have been on the record. Is Fight it gonna be? Is it? Well, be? I mean, who even cares anymore? It's going to be on the Spotify. We're going to have all of them. I mean, it I kind know. of is. And and what I hate is that people always think of bonus tracks as like throwaways. How many times is a bonus track or a B side better than something that's on the record? For sure. Fight of your life. Fight of your life's cool, and the lyric cracks me up because he's obviously singing in the battle. You're the last man standing. Because of his accent, it sounds like he's singing in the bathtub. The last, I'm the last man standing, <laughs> and it's like it sounds like he's saying the bathtub because I, I it caught me. I'm like, is he singing about the bathtub? And I'm listening closer. It's like in the battle. I'm yeah. like, wow, okay, but it's a great hook, a great chorus, and it's it's a highlight of the record for me. And it probably should have been there instead of like, dare I say it, even the title track of the album or something like that. It's a great song. It's definitely not filler, throwaway, or bonus to me. It's like an essential part of the listening experience. I agree. Perrin, what do you think? Oh, yeah, I like it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. People kind of forget where bonus tracks came from, right? Like, it used to be that you would have bonus tracks on the Japan albums, and you had them on the Japan albums because <laughs> records were so expensive in Japan. You had to kind of give people a little bit something extra 
to, to get them to buy it. So they weren't throwaway tracks or just B-sides or demos. They were good stuff. And I completely agree with Giles. This is one of the best songs on, on the record. So if, if, if we are influencers in any way, if anybody is on the fence, if they're buying a physical copy and they're between buying the regular copy and spending an extra eight bucks for the three bonus songs, buy the bonus version just for this song, if nothing else, because it's great. It's, I, I think the chorus in the song is the second catchiest or the co-catchiest on the record, along with Crown of Horns. Uh, it has this delivering the goods almost kind of intro that I think is really cool. It's kind of like old and new at the same time. Uh, and the guitar tone, the, the, Richie's tone in this one is amazing. So this was another one of my put two asterisks next to it. Hey, my, two out of two. My, my two <laughs> asterisks were this one and uh, Escape from Reality, along with some of the stuff we've already heard. So definitely this song makes the bonus version worth it. Tom, you know what I like about this song is it's inspirational. So if you're dying of cancer or you have a sickness and you're fighting, you know, you put it or on. Or if, you like... ba- if you're in the bathtub. Or if you're in the bathtub <laughs> trying to get out of it you're because right, you right. slipped and fell. <laughs> you're the last man standing. <laughs> Tom, well, what'd, you... Job, so like yeah. that. what'd you think? Yeah. This is one of my favorite. Yeah, this is one of my favorite tracks on the album too. Rob singing higher, higher pitched. Not not quite screeching, but he's up there on this one. Mm-hmm. The the leads are really good on this song, and from a drummer standpoint, I love the use of the China symbol. China symbol has a really unique sound, and Scott utilizes it in this song. But it's one of my favorite songs on on the album. And then I like pear, and I have a star with an exclamation point. <laughs> so so I think we could. It's safe to say that all four of us think this should have been on the proper no album. No doubt about it. And I will as a I will track. buy, if it comes out on CD with bonus tracks, I will buy the bonus tracks. Okay, well, that's a good thing too, right? That's a great yeah. thing. All yeah. right, here we go. Perrin, Vicious Circle. Uh, no, this one, so this was, for me, this was kind of a bonus track that's just kind of like, yeah, there. <laughs> I mean, and nothing on this record is bad. Nothing on this record offends me. This Vicious <laughs> Circle to me, though, was just kind of like, I mean, it is a bit fight. I even the I don't know if you guys remember the band Helmet from the '90s. I I felt I felt this was like a very '90s, 2000s sounding song, and for some people that'll be good, and for some people that'll be bad. But uh, yeah, this this one just didn't really go anywhere for me necessarily. So of the three bonus tracks, it was my least favorite, and it made me say, "Okay, was this really necessary?" Okay, all right, Tom, what'd you think? I like it. Um, great opening riff. It's a short song. It's to the point. Well, hold on, hold on. Pause, pause for one second. Perrin, on bonus track or not, or should have been on the album, the the proper album or not? It didn't need to be on the album, and I don't even think it needed to be a bonus track. (laughs) Okay, it should have just been completely written off. All right, Tom. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I think it should be on the album. I like it that much because that's a pretty good. It's a basic song. The, The lead part is not a smoking lead on this particular track it's pretty just there but i love the the opening riff for me carries through the song so that's why i like it that much okay and giles what did we talk about vicious didn't, circle didn't do a whole didn't do a whole lot for me um i liked escape from reality i'm not so crazy about this song to me it's kind of this is truly like b-side material it's interesting how Escape from Reality and, and Vicious Circle sound more like Helford solo stuff, as I said, or even as parents said, Fight. And I think these two songs really reveal the lack of Atlan and KK as 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 like fully like full time members because it is starting to sound a bit more like Helford solo stuff, but then Helford solo stuff also sounded plenty like plenty like Priest as well. So it's perhaps a moot point, but it just feels like there's other hands in it at this point, you know. Yeah, it um, sounds like more like Metal Mike and Patrick uh, Lockman than it does. Yeah, yeah, Eddie it just KK. doesn't seem like, it doesn't sound like either Glenn or even KK. It sort of sounds like, you know, it, it's, it's just the influences coming from different people, different places on those two songs. <laughs> it just, it's, it's probably the, the only song on the whole record that I'm probably just going to like perpetually skip for the rest of so, my life. So, so you're like Perrin, it's not, doesn't deserve to be a bonus yeah, unless track. I wake it should be up, a B-side on a demo somewhere. Unless I wake up tomorrow and I'm like, hey, this is my favorite song on the record, because that has happened before, but I don't sure. think so. This one does just, just isn't me, you know? Okay. 
And Tom, you didn't tell me. Did you keep this on the album as I a would. bonus track, or you just I'd, toss it all together? I'd have it on the album. Well, he likes it, so of course yeah. he'll keep it on the album. Well, he Maybe he just wants to keep it, it as a album. bonus track. Oh, I'd put it on the album. Oh. All right. Okay, I'd put yeah. it on the album. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. I think you meant like just wipe it out altogether. Like, <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> no, like Hit the delete gen- button. Musical genocide. Just eliminate <laughs> it. You know? right. All right. Last last bonus track, uh, Giles, The Lodger. Very Blue Oyster Cult type of song, actually. I like it a lot. Really cool. Okay. Should have been on the album. Should have been on the album, Perrin. This is what a bonus track should be. This reminds me of some of the Maiden bonus tracks that couldn't be on the album because they were just different. You know, like you wouldn't put Sheriff of Huddersfield or whatever, like on an album, it would need to be a B-side. This is different. This is like just so different. It's it's like, it's Rob Halford doing his uh, David it's Bowie. It's because Bob Halligan Jr. wrote it, that's why. Yeah, it, well, look, I find there's a theatrical delivery. There's like a spacey vibe to it. I mean, obviously there's a lot of storytelling. It's like musical theater. So uh, yeah, I, I think this is a, I, it's my middle of the three bonus tracks, but it's it's good. And did, it has Bob, place. did Bob write this one? Yeah, Bob did Holligan Bob Jr. Yeah, he wrote it and he gave it to nice. them. Yeah, for he wrote it a few years ago and he's been trying to really get it cool. them to play it. And you can see it's different because they didn't write it. You know, there's it a is different, different. vibe. And, and so to answer your question before you ask it, I wouldn't have it on the album, but I would have it as a B side because for me it's what a B side is supposed to be. Well, what about bonus track? It's, well, I'm uh, sorry, I, uh, I would have it as a bonus track. It's, okay. it's it, is a bonus. It, it is It is a bonus track. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. He would keep it like a, there. He would keep it there. He wouldn't shift that. It, it, so it doesn't keep necessarily it. fit with the rest of the album, but it's from the same sessions. It's different. It's interesting. So I, I think having it as a bonus track is the perfect place to put it. And again, it makes the bonus track version of the album worth it. Okay. Tom? I didn't like it. I listened to it twice, and those will be the last two times I ever listened to that song. It's horrible. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. Sorry. Right. It's just not, it so doesn't he, even so fit. He, so he doesn't like it. I hate it. So you would it's delete like, the file completely, right? You I would. Put I, on the bonus. I you wouldn't put clunker. on the album. Not even a B side. It would be it's some a obscure. Don't sort of... even, what, are you, what are you doing? This doesn't even get this out of here. It's horrible. I hate okay. it. I Sorry. like it, but I'm like, parent, I would keep it as a bonus track. As it is. I wouldn't change it. I would keep it. It's where it should be. That's what I want to say. It's where it should be. Totally agree. And Vicious vicious Circle, I would delete it. And uh, Fight of Your Life, I would definitely put it on the proper album. So if you didn't buy the deluxe version, it would be on that album. That's where I would put it. But it's okay as a bonus track too. All right, guys. So let's talk about... All right. The first four singles was Panic Attack, The Serpent and the King, King, Crown of... Horns, Horns and Trial by Fire. Now that you've heard the rest of the album, were those songs a good choice? Were those songs the right choices for the first four singles, or would you have chosen another four songs, Tom? I'm fine with the four that they selected because I thought it was a little bit, you know, mix of styles of songs. Um, mm-hmm. We can nitpick and say, well, you know this one song here, I could replace it with one song there. And I'm fine with what they released together as a foursome. I think it's pretty decent. I'm good with it. And I never, I thought that, you know, listening to them without obviously hearing the rest of the album, but I'm cool with it. That's fine with me. Do they, did they represent what the album is like? Um, Diverse? I don't think. Production wise. I think they, you know, if you wanted to just, you know. Slice and dice slice it up like that yes they could have put one of the harder songs on and replaced it with any one of the three but or four i should say mm-hmm. but nah i'm cool i'm fine with it. i think it represents the album pretty good yeah okay good all right it. what about you parent would you have kept those four if you go back in time and you're the management of judas priest you go you know what these are the four we're going with yeah i think or they not. represent the album really well i think you you have the serpent and the king which is kind of heavy and fast you have Crown of Horns, which is kind of more melodic. You have Panic Attack that started with that synth and the Rototoms that kind of showed that there was going to be some different stuff happening on this album. Mm-hmm. And you had uh, Trial by Fire, which is very, again, epic, kind of marching Judas Priest. So I think the four kind of showed a lot of different facets of this record. And I guess that's what you want to do with advanced singles, right? You want to say, you know, here's, a, here's kind of an overview of what this record is about. And I think the four of them 
are an overview of what the album's about. Yeah. And I think they're all quite good. Like I, 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 in their own right, they're different. But those four, along with a couple that I mentioned as double star songs, are my favorite on the record. So I, I think, I think very, very good choice of singles. What about you, Giles? Good choices of first singles? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah I, more or less, yeah. I mean, Crown of Horns is an amazing song. I love it. Could listen to things like that all day, and I do. Yeah, um, that's, that's a great track, yeah. I, I would be, I would be just, I mean, I, you know, I'd be tempted to go, like, make Gates of Hell the fourth single instead of Serpent of the King, but then I don't want to buy an album where the the four best songs I've already heard. I, I like, <laughs> still want some... <laughs> I still want yeah. that's that's actually a like, very good point that's a great point like is, yeah. there's enough surprises of the songs that you haven't heard right yeah because a lot yeah, of times right. you buy the you know you hear the first four singles or three singles yeah. that's it and then that there's nothing here. left they've right. shot their load on the, they've shot their load on right. all the that's singles it. and the rest of the album you don't even feel is as good as the stuff yeah because i already feel like i wished i hadn't listened to the singles because i can imagine how much more i'd be enjoying this album if i'm hearing panic attack and uh, a crown of horns uh, in particular for the very first time. I'm wondering if that's somehow hurting my my uh, e experience of the album, maybe. But you know, as time goes on, that'll be where I go to listen to those songs, and I will listen to it as a as a full piece of work. But right now, I'm kind of skipping past the ones I've heard already and dealing with what's left. And then out of what's left, there's like two that I think are like could be singles, killer killer tracks. And then some other very very good stuff, and then some then a couple that are like not so much. I kind of wish I'd had it all fresh, you know. But um, mm -hmm. you know, you gotta have singles, otherwise no one will buy an album, I guess. Yep. Mm -hmm. But there are songs outside of the four that they released that I like more than them. So that's always like you were saying, yeah. Jesus, they, yeah. you, you shot you your load, load on right? It, right? So there are a couple songs that I like more than each one of those four songs. I like those yeah, four yeah. songs, but I, I think they go higher too, even in that. So that's right. a nice surprise. So let's, let's some closing remarks about your overall feeling about the album and, you know, just give it a rating out of 10. You know what? I get it. You know what your what you feel about it today might not necessarily be the same rating a year from now, but what do you feel? How do you feel about it right now, Tom? Well, I mean, your I, overall thoughts about this album. How does where does it stand in the catalog? And yeah, how would you yeah. Rank it? I like it more than well, only two listens in, so mm -hmm. I could change. I could go up or down. I don't know how it's going to shake out, but I like it right now more than Firepower. Okay, that's good. and I like Firepower. Okay, um, I got it out of a ten scale. I got it at an eight right now. It might go okay, to eight. Okay, Tom, eight. <laughs> it might it's, go. It's got to sit. It's got to sit better. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So right. I'm I'm really happy with it. I was okay. pleasantly surprised. I was a little afraid of what it could possibly have turned out to be, but I. <laughs> <laughs> and you never know anymore. You try to write 150 songs and come up with something good. <laughs> think, when you think about it that way, ooh, that's that's not easy. Good no, songs, it's not. Charles. Yeah. What do you I think? only write good songs. Um, <laughs> the I wasn't worried. I, mean, what about, I don't even care that much. You know, I couldn't care enough to be worried. You know, it's like Judas Priest. It's not the end of the world if they make an album that's not so good. That's happened before, but I do. I like it a lot. I really like it. Um, it's not quite firepower to me, though. That that had like uh, rising, rising from ruins, and a few other you know things that just really. That was a special album. They come along once or twice in a career. This is a very very strong follow up or a very very strong album, but it's not firepower. Okay, fair enough. Would you how would you rate it out of ten today? Oh, I don't know, like give it a seven or something that's pretty pretty damn high considering okay. eights nines and tens are considered uh, saved for the greatest albums of our generation or two you know where would firepower be out of ten you know i'd give four and a four like a nine you know to put it in perspective i'd give mob rules like a 10 out of 10 so you know you've got to save those higher marks for the classics this is this this is a set this is a really strong seven out of ten okay parent you know, what I like about this record is I think it's a trip through Judas Priest history. So if it's the last record, I think there's something on this record for every era of fan. Maybe more in the 79 to 90 kind of fan. Like, I, I think this record draws a lot from Hellbent for Leather to Painkiller, but also it sounds like they're, they're modern stuff. It fits in with Firepower. It fits in with the reunion era of Judas Priest. Uh, I think it might be. I, I love Firepower. 
I would give Firepower an 8, but I would also give this an 8. So I, for me, it's right there with Firepower. I think it's a bit more diverse than Firepower, and that's why I might give it a slight advantage over Firepower. Uh, Rob sounds great. How produced it is, we don't know. I think Richie's playing is like Guitar Hero, or the guitar playing, that's not to say Richie. I think the guitar playing on this record mm. is Guitar Hero level playing. Yeah, man. And I think the rhythm section is solid, and I really want to call out Scott Travis. This just this isn't just rapid fire, double bass, trigger drums, every song. Tom alluded to it. There's a lot of different things happening in different songs and nuance and heavy playing, but there's also subtle playing. I think this is a fantastic drum performance by Scott Travis on this record. So great rhythm section, great guitars, great vocals, diverse songs. Eight on ten, excellent record for me. I would say I'm more in the Tom camp than the Perrin camp and the Giles camp. I think it's a step up from Firepower. There, it's it's kind of like Firepower Plus, you know, yeah. like you well, said, I said. I, I said, a little that. more I diverse, a little more intricate in terms of musical passages throughout the, the album. Maybe I've lived with it more, so I can hear those little nuances over time. But I would definitely put it in like 8.5, 8.6 out of 10. I think it's a strong, strong album. Mm -hmm. But that's yeah. just me. That's just well me, done, guys. Man. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time and reviewing this album. I think people will really get a good feel for what this album is like from all these diverse opinions, diverse opinions on the album, and diverse <laughs> opinions on the songs. Everybody yeah. pick up the new Judas Priest album, Invincible Shield. Yep, you want to buy it. <laughs> <laughs>